Okay, so the actual real reason I wanted to, to uh, talk to you is because of this new font fun functionality. Yeah, yeah. So let me so is, is, is a project thinking about including uh, new fonts, or is this uh, more about text and font dialogue work that you've been been doing? I had a had a question about what users thought. Um, it's not anything that anybody's talked about inside the project. I just was okay. like, yeah. Yeah. this is actually an interesting discussion. Should Inkscape actually have fonts or not? I, I view it as kind of like, I mean, obviously not exactly the same, but if I think about like brushes in, in GIMP or Krita or something where it's like, yeah, people will want to make their own brushes and people want to share and include brushes from a, a community of people who make things. That's pretty normal, but it's also like super handy to have a base set of of things that uh, allow you to use the tool without engaging in that, you know? Yeah. So do you, want, do, you, do you want to know why this is like going around in my mind? Is because yeah. we don't even have a baseline set of fonts that we can use in tests, right? Yep. So like you run the test suite on Linux and you get one result. You run the test suite on Mac OS, you get a different result because the fonts are That's different. That's less handy. That's annoying. Yeah. Right? And so there's an entire um, like s set of coping mechanisms inside the test suite for like injecting fonts in to the right. Suite. Right. So we have some you, fun. you're doing automated image comparison stuff to see whether or not you've got yeah 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 no definitely I can I can see that being That's incredibly right. useful in that case. Well, why not just have some fonts we actually show? Yeah, it's well, like, like, like weird stuff. There's also a, an opportunity to be a part of the open font license ecosystem and and sort of showcase font creators who are releasing stuff under open culture licenses, that that feels like a really valuable thing to potentially be doing. Yeah, especially if they're using Scape to make the font, because I know a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah, um, they, that was that was something I was going to ask you about, was whether you've you've heard of many people using Inkscape to yeah, create yeah, fonts. What people do is they use uh, FontForge and Inkscape like, together, and right. FontForge does all the like, organizational work, and then they bring the glyphs into Inkscape as the editor, as like the editor, right? Uh, and 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 we have entire functionality for for um, glyph work. So, Sweet. It, yeah, it's 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 like it's a workflow you wouldn't even think about, but it but it does exist, and you can see the SVG font editor. It's an entire di dialogue. Wow. Oh, okay. This is this is new to me. Uh, very cool. I'm I'm excited to explore and investigate this at some point. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, there's there's entire settings there, and I think what people do is they base, create an SVG font and then they bring it into uh, Font Forge and stuff, and then then they they do all the proper kerning and yeah, chops it up and assigns the glyphs and does all the stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, this is in this 1.3 version. A Google Summer of Code student developed a piece of fun functionality called Font Collections, and okay. we were talking briefly about how uh, people ask us about you know hiding and sorting out their fonts because there's just a lot going on. Yeah, I ran uh, FC list. Is it FC list something? Yes. Uh, in and it said oh. I had 600 <laughs> installed. Inkscape doesn't show 600, but yeah. I've got, so I've got plenty of fonts on my system. This, this week's piece of work that I've done, which I'll be doing a video about the, the, the weekend, is actually uh, making sure that Inkscape can load new fonts when you install them. So before, if you installed a font, you'd have to restart Inkscape. Yeah. Whereas now with this fix, you, it, it detects that you have, had, you have a new font installed, and it adds it wow. to the list. Um, it's a piece of that UX that it's just really annoying if you hit it. Oh, I was going to say, like, effort versus reward, That's uh, that feels like quite an investment in uh, in in a small piece of UX. I guess I guess that's because I'm used to the idea of just I restart my applications once I install a font. Um, but the, as a pro developer, I'm thinking immediately in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, no, 
okay, well, this is a cross-platform problem or like a per-platform problem, right? Like it's yeah. not something that you can run and once and immediately Linux. apply everywhere. Yeah. I only fixed it for Linux. Um, oh, okay, right. I, I, I recruited somebody to fix it for Win Windows and I've asked, started making inquiries into the Mac OS specific versions of it. Yeah. But at the very least, uh, I've shown that it's possible to do and um, I did yeah. a whole, whole, whole bunch of investigation into Win Windows registry editing and registry monitoring and stuff like I, I theoretically know how to do it in Win Windows, but I have no real way to te test it properly. Does so, it have a performance uh, overhead or is it just something that you ping every five seconds or something? The, the Linux version doesn't even need a polling. Um, right. We just, we just uh, um, connect to a GTK signal that is looking at the property um, font cache oh. timestamp. And if well, that's GTK. Signal, <laughs> yeah. If that signal kicks off, it will be updated. Yeah. Fantastic. That's perfect. Yeah, it's good. Like the actual solution is like ridiculously small compared to the headache that it has caused for a it, lot of people. It could be. Yeah. 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 And some of the reasons why previous versions, people have tried to fix this before is that um, there's just a bit of consideration about when you get the signal, what do you do? What do you tell Inkscape to do? Um, right. And, uh, like you know, do how how do you refresh this list? Do you destroy it all and then recreate it all? Do you um, do it in the graphical user interface or do you do it in in like some core part? Do you have caches to be considered? Is Pango ca caching things? Is from config ca caching things? And yeah, it, it what it really boils down to is doing doing the research into what these tools expect and holy hell, from con config has one of the worst documentations that I've ever seen. I think the Docs are just one line. It's just oh, like no. here is the yeah here is the development and and and, and everything else is is, is auto generated, and um, all all the auto generated stuff has no com comments about what the stuff does. So you have to infer oh, what they okay. do make from their function names. It's like you would have had a better you would have had a better chance from a reverse engineered <laughs> library. Yeah. Then this, then this pillar of free software, like literally. I, I was going to say it's integral to. Yeah. yeah, just like oh my god, so get get a doc right writer and like fill it out. Come on, um, but yeah, once once you work out like what needs to happen, it, it, it all falls into place, and you suddenly find oh, it's thirteen lines. That's that's all that's need, needed. But which thirteen? Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, so this this is not the what I just talked about is not really related to this uh, piece of fun functionality, which is the Google Summer of Code, um, which is the font collections. Um, it it, it uh, the, this button here pop, pops up a little pop up with two check boxes: one that says document fonts, and the one that says recently used fonts, and then a button that says open collections editor. The open collections editor opens this dialog here, which says font collections. Mm -hmm. um, this is me exploring because I didn't write it and I don't really know how it works or what the design right. decisions were. So I'm hoping that we could work together on discovering this piece of fun functionality. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think historically um, Inkscape has always sort of pinned anything that's used in the document to the top as yes. as kind of a default behavior. Although I noticed a bug in that last night um, that if you've got a different default font, it doesn't put that at the top until after you've applied that font or another font to a text object. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. So I think sans serif is nailed in uh, so so hard. That even though some yeah. serif isn't on the system, you can see it's crossed out. It's still there as a default. Huh. And that's a bug. That's a bug in one point three. Fairly certain. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, I yeah. have dialogue, and then it says font collections on the. Uh... Unfortunately, I can't see. Uh, do Do you have like another dialogue on top? No. No. This is this this okay. font. This dialog that you can see is what I'm looking at. Yes, it's... yes. I you had brought down the uh, the font drop down for a second there, which I, I couldn't see, 
and yeah, mentioned that the oh, yeah, sensor yeah, yeah. kind of struck through. Yeah, that one. Uh, but that's fine. Okay. So uh, yeah. So so this is this is the weird user ex experience where you have font collections on the right hand side and all fonts on the left yeah. hand side. And I then, understand the flow of you're progressing from left, which is everything, to right, which is your finished list right. of things that you're going to be using. But yeah, I don't know if it necessarily works. Please. Okay, so you can drag and drop them. Okay, that's good. Just good. Uh, so I've created a serif and I put free serif in there. And I'm going to put deja vu serif. Okay, so it closes every time you drag one in. All right, that's annoying. That is. Can you change their order, or are they sorted alphabetically? Uh, that they like. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like I can. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can't drag them out either. You've got to use the the little one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm going to do a search. Can I? Okay. So can I grab all of these? No, nope, I can't multi-select either. So yeah, multi-select would be nice there. It, I was doing some looking last night, and it's a real shame that it doesn't seem like um, there's any kind of tag support in the um, true type or open document uh, or open type format. Um, Specs like it would be nice if you could say, "Show me all the fantasy fonts." Right. Yes, I think it, you can add tags yourself, but that's a lot of work. And one of the things that yeah. I thought about is uh, there's a lot of really nerdy art artists out, out there who, if they knew that their librarian work of like adding tags to fonts would be shared, they would definitely do it. Right. Yeah. And, and like as a as someone who who uses this as a production tool and has a library of fonts that I that I use, I wouldn't be averse to investing the time in in throwing a bunch of tags or signifiers on my entire font collection for my own uses. But yeah, the idea of a shared communal uh, font registry is uh, with metadata is cool. Okay, so I've got four fonts in my serifs. Okay. Uh, and I've made a sans. I'm going to try and build a sans list. Um, Avenir looks like so, a sansy type thing. I feel like there's not enough preview here, right? Like the amount of screen real estate you need to come up with in order to see some of these wider fonts and get a feel for what they are and what they do is, yeah. um, is slightly untenable. Yeah, I think I agree. Uh, and it's difficult to know, like, I'm editing, I'm editing this list right now, and there's no indication mm. that like, Fira Sans is already in this list, right? So yeah. I've like, a number of times, which is good that it doesn't duplicate, but it's still... Yeah, it would be nice if you, like, selected a font in the left panel that had highlighted both the collection and the font in the, the right panel, just to help you navigate that. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's fine for, like, two or three things, but the moment you've got, you know, dozens, it's it's going to be tough to keep track of. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, sans. Okay, so I've got four sans, six serifs. Yeah. And then I'm going to make a... Uh, write, what do you call it, like, script? For yeah. Type scripts. to me I think birthday cake <laughs> I was searching for a gothic script and I found uh, like f literally for a thing that I was doing called bir birthday cake for the video if you saw saw it and I saw the font was literally called gothic birthday cake and I had to had to use it Hunter. It's always funny how a font collection grows. Like you go out and you find fonts appropriate for a project, and then suddenly your entire collection is weighted towards whatever that project's use case is, and your next project isn't that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that 
one script. And the thing is, like, I, I delete fonts because of this problem of not being able to have, you know, a mm. curated list. Um, okay, so I've I've created a couple of lists of things. Yeah. Uh, and now, theoretically, if I exit that and I click on this button, and I'll have to describe what I see because it's not on the thing. Oh, I can see that one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so that's using some kind of different widget. I click on sans and serifs to the two chat right. boxes, and what I see in this drop down that you can't see is just those fonts, just the sans and the serifs. Okay, that that seems handy. What does the text and font dialog look like? Does that update as well? Text, text and font. So this says yeah. collections. It's yeah. Collections is there, and. Yeah, it updates automatically. Nice, nice. So what's features? That's Oh, that's your, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know that. You, it's annoying that you can't edit the, like, sample text until after you've made a text object and had it selected. This this text, um, yeah. yeah. So, oh, this. Box. Yeah, you've got to make a text object in the uh, in the thing, and then type some stuff, and that should show up in there. And now you edit it, but until you've got an object to um, to mess with, it's a uh, uh, text. Yeah, it's invisible. Ah, right. It's the alpha. I was like, hang on, what's going on here? <laughs> okay, so so yeah, so now now you can see it. You can edit that in the in the text tab now as well, if you wanted to have something other than what is in that text, which is handy, right? Like you, for me at least, I want to do some some examples that aren't necessarily a part of my document when I'm working out what fonts I'm going to use. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a book. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit, a little bit tricky. Okay, so I think I'm getting getting a hang of like what this is, and, and I can yeah. definitely see tons of like edges that need to be sanded down a bit. The broad concept, though, I think is good. Like yeah. the ability to to filter and truncate things down to stuff that you just care about for a particular project is great, and presumably this is saved for Inkscape as a whole rather than just the document. Yes, I'm fairly certain about that. But I'm going to open up a new window, which you can't see, um, and I'll conf confirm that to you. Confirmed, yeah, so. Yeah, which is, is both good and maybe not always as good. Like, I know that my need, like each project, as I was saying before, is going to have its own needs and its own style and, and whatever else, and so, um, I don't know. Yeah, no, I guess it makes sense to keep it application-wide, because then you can you don't have to hunt back through old stuff or duplicate work. Yeah, I and you've still got stuff used in the document as well. I think what I would do That's is not... I would have it so that the um, uh, the this this had an export an import button. Yes. Yeah. Thousand like percent. That would be cool. That would basically allow you to just pop like this list out and then save it somewhere with your documents or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That would that would work well. Because I can imagine a situation where you've got like 80 collections or something because you've got a very broad or diverse range of work that you do and then wanting yeah. to be able to then truncate this list down to something manageable is uh, I've it does seen, feel I've like seen thousands and thousands of fonts that people install. Yeah. And they're like, why is Inkscape so slow? And it's because programmers <laughs> have 10 fonts and we yeah. program the font stuff to be really lazy and just lo reload everything all of the time. And your six thousand yeah. now take forever. Yeah, users. It'll all be a lot easier without users. <laughs> um. Yeah, you, 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 your, your games. Do do you have a lot of feed, feedback from like you, you sell on Steam, right? Um. So. <sighs> Of the games that I have sold commercially, all of them are on Itch, which is like a pay-what-you-want platform. Yeah. 
um, or, or all the stuff that I've sold is, is pay what you want. I don't have any fixed price stuff at the moment. This project that I'm working on at the moment, I got a small grant for, and as part of meeting my grant obligations, I feel like I need to ship it on Steam. They were very anxious about the idea of me shipping games on itch. I was like, all right, calm down. It's going to be on Steam. It's fine. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I usually, usually sort of go with a pay what you want model because I feel like that's, again, pushing back against some of the capitalist structures that we're <laughs> rigidly bound by in today's society. I'd like, it sucks when financial hurdles shouldn't be a like a, a barrier to participation in culture. That, that feels like an unhealthy, that's uncivilized in my mind. Um, and while the timing of doing that on the cusp of a pandemic and global onset of a global recession, like uh, threatening people's lives and livelihoods, has probably made people less confident in unnecessary expenses. Um, yeah, it's, it's timing hasn't been great, but I'm still glad that, that that's the approach that I've taken. Nice. And yeah, I, I, for Hive Time, I had like 100 people prior to release testing the game, um, about, about 100, 100 keys that I've given out with varying levels of, of, of feedback. Like, obviously, I'm kind of like, well, if you're giving me feedback that helps me make my game, then uh, I like, ideally, I should be paying you, but I don't have any money. So, uh, you know, whatever you feel like contributing is, is greatly appreciated. So varying levels of, of useful feedback but just the idea of having that number of people at least poke the game and run it once uh has been valuable for sure and then yeah if i get a user who's like hey i want this thing um i weigh up whether or not it fits within my vision and intent for the project and if it's if it if it's not a problem for me like for example i always in hive time in particular viewed the radial menu interaction as part of the game's pacing like it's meant to be a slow game that you you don't rush at and you think about your actions before you do them. But there are some people who are like, I want a shortcut to just repeat. You know, click, I want to put down a million cells at once. And, uh, you know, I, I was wanted to think long and hard about whether or not that was a good idea, but I implemented it and they were absolutely right. It's a lot of fun to just put down a whole bunch of stuff and then let the hive go and do its thing to, uh, to build all that stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, the way in which we do escape development is um, we try not to have a vision. That sounds yeah. like bananas because, like in in games, you would definitely have like oh, we're doing this. This is how the game. Works. Yeah, yeah. There's there's like a experience that is crafted and yeah. consciously crafted. But but I think also you're coming from that perspective of Inkscape is already a functional tool, and yeah. maybe that is. Like, yeah, after after Hive Time is released, then I'm much more in a, a position where I can experiment and, and kind of try things that are a little bit out without without clouding that initial experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 kind of interesting because there are developers who I think would be and, and some some users I think who would be uh um they, they would choose to make decisions in a very certain narrow way. Yeah. And you get the feedback from them about like what they'd like to see in the thing. And then you have to balance that and integrate it. It's not good enough yeah. to either, either dismiss and or do blindly. You have to be able to integrate it. And, you know, for, for a vision, it sounds more like there's uh, forethought put into it. Not really yeah. forethought. It's more, um, collectivism being thoughtful and weighing it up at the at the time you know yeah i mean it's part it's participation yeah. and it's respect for the people who made decisions in the past yeah. and the and the respect for the people who need to be able to progress today and the yeah. hope is that you find a a solution which is actually better than anybody could have thought up right that that that, that dialectical te tension gives you a a better it gives uh, you a fertile ground for new ideas, right? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I, 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 I genuinely dislike the way the GNOME pro project designs things. I think it is, I think it is yeah. way too centralized, way too dismissive. But to be honest, it's yep. snobby and elitist. Just to be, just yeah, to be yeah. like, and and I think that's not wanted to be. I don't think the people involved in it 
are snobby and elitist themselves, like as human beings, but I think that the project that they have created definitely is. Behaves and, that way, yeah, yeah. Behaves that way, yeah. And it's unfortunate because it's got a lot of, there's a lot of love for none, but none of that love can really materially enter the project because it's got yep. this like force fields up of like, no, you, if you want to participate, we need like checkbooks out, you need to be committing yeah. super lots of time and you're like, I mean, I understand the desire to say, let's get our minimal streamlined experience up and happening before we get bogged down in expanding it out to be everything else. Like from just a general project management perspective, I can see the rationale, but I used to, my last day job, my boss uses focus follow, follows mouse. And that's something that has not been prioritized in GNOME, at least at the time that I was working there, because I don't use it. I don't pay a lot of attention to that feature, but he was constantly every day since GNOME 3 shipped, very, very angry about how focus follows mouse had been ignored. And he couldn't understand the idea that anybody who was a developer wouldn't use focus follows mouse. And I'm oh, like, well, yeah, yeah. So it's like at, at the GNOME level, like you, you don't like need to alt tab or click on a window to give it focus. It just automatically focuses when you move the mouse onto it, which I don't know, as someone who constantly like flicks the mouse onto another screen to get it out of the way while I'm working, uh, that's not, that's not compatible with how I work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, 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 I dread to think what that does to Inkscape. Um, oh, so yeah. I, we, we've just crashed it by the way. Oh, exciting. Except, Any idea yeah. what caused that? I wasn't paying yeah. much attention. So I'll, I'll, I'll show the entire screen because you couldn't actually see it. So I press the reset collections button um, and, yeah. and it, pops, it pops up. Now, this is a new dialogue that we've added that oh. does the entire crash back. It gives you instructions of like file a bug with a little link. You can click on that and go to, uh, you know, new yeah, issue. Handy. Nice. And then, yeah, and then and then so like you can see this this uh, new document has been been created with my text, um, and 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 hopefully this should make it easier for people to to report bugs that especially crashes and, and we'll get them fixed. Um, so what does it say? It says, "GTK container get ch children of the display font collections." So it looks like it tried to. Um, interrogate a GTK wi wi widget that had already been destroyed. Yeah. Possibly, possibly because it wasn't even being, it wasn't even resident. Res res um, nice. Okay, so that's dead. I've paid, I've copied the the core dump already. Um, yeah. So I'm showing the entire screen, so you can still see this, right? Yeah. So if I go to time to draw tab, do you see here it says new document one? And then on the uh, right hand side, it says emergency save in the, uh, the video is, is taking a moment to update. Oh. The time to draw tab has not come up yet. Oh, interesting. It's that. Let me uh, unsure and reshare again. So yeah, do you, do you have any quick questions about the new 1.3? Um, I, again, I'm sort of on older versions, so I'm not that um, up to speed on what uh, what 1.3 is doing at the moment. Um, but uh, I guess I guess I can tell you about my biggest current friction point, which I think is across all like is is something that's that's carried forward in in probably all current versions of and future versions of Inkscape for now at least, um, uh, which is adjacent to something that you mentioned earlier about changing shortcuts to not um, to not use like Alt T or whatever, because that will bring up the text menu, right? Right. Um, I do, my, my workflow for, for art usually involves uh, setting and releasing clipping masks quite frequently. Um, and my old workflow for that was Alt O P S um, cause although we'll bring up the object menu and historically pressing P would bring up the clip sub menu and then S would be like set clip. 
Um, but now there's a whole bunch of things with the same mnemonics in those menus that mean that I can't anymore use that. Uh, okay, that so nice it, I've got it open here. Uh, so it now would be Control Shift L, right? Because uh, it's a dialog. Well, Alt OPS is object menu and then clip menu and then set clip. Like it's it's the oh, it's the object menu. It's, sorry. Yeah, it's navigating the menus with the keyboard, which I can't do anymore. So Alt O P S. And now it brings up the CSS selector sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Um, because if if you press P after bringing up the object menu, and now there's the paint servers, there's the clip sub menu, there's the pop selected group objects out of group gets highlighted, even though the underlined mnemonic is a P for some reason. Mm. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then yeah, the S becomes like the yeah. It doesn't it doesn't go into that menu. It would be lovely, and I I really don't feel comfortable asking people to do work that I'm not willing to do myself. But I feel like the kind of feedback that you were talking about wanting to be able to to get access to, um, for me at least, uh, having unique menu mnemonics is is very very helpful, <laughs> very you, important for me. Let me show you how to do this. Yeah. Right. So you don't have to rely on me to do actually do anything for you. I can change the menu mnemonics manually. Oh, that's handy. It's nice. So the file called menus.ui, right? And it's and it's loaded uh, by by the normal um, rules in Inkscape where it lo tries to load all files from your config directory first, and then the system install okay. overrides the installed version. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So you can install, you can override things. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to, for some reason, get rid of the open recent, say I don't want to get rid of yeah. that much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's say if I remove the save a copy. So what I'm going to do is I copy this menu's UI file and I put it in my config in escape. Can I have a UI folder? Yeah. And then let's see if this works, because this is theoretical until you actually do it. So yeah. get rid of save template because like who wants that? And I'm gonna go for what was it, clip? So set clip. Yeah, so um it's it's more that the P for the clip submenu is shared by boss okay. selected uh, okay. and, and another one further up as well. So if I remove this underscore which removes the Mnemonic. Yeah. The, the other server. one was paint servers. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. So that those go away. And that would probably I'll... make it behave the way that I'm used to, at least. Okay. So I save that, and then I go to Inkscape. Um, I need to did you, restart. Did you even see the menus when I when when I loaded them? Uh, no, I didn't. Sorry. Okay. So let me. I'll just. Boost the entire screen. Okay, so you can see here when I load it from the command line, I do inkscape profile dir equals as a, so okay, I, can give nice. it, I can give it its own directory. Um, but actually, I, I just edited it in my in my normal. Oh, right, that's true. Yeah. Uh, okay, so object. Uh, let's see. First of all, did my save as template? Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. So now, if I go, what, what was it? Alt. O O P S and but now we've got two of those, so we would need to. I would need to do that as well. But at least uh, P gets you into that sub menu. Yes, yes. Uh, where previously it wasn't. Yeah. Okay. That that's good to know. That's something that I hadn't really poked around with before. But well, from a general you... UX perspective. Yeah. So that's you... so. I can tell you that I do not think that this this menus file is being curated with intent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, obviously, people are putting functionality in and going, well, what's the best mnemonic for the thing that I'm adding, not how does this fit within the menu? Yes. And, and yeah. if there was something that I would think would be relatively easy to participate in and you genuinely wanted to contribute, this might be it. Yeah, yeah. I, it's always tough, right? Like, I'm in the middle of a project right now, which is was meant to have a 10-month project uh, production schedule, and now I'm a year and three months in or a year and four months in or something. So I'm like way behind on 
all that stuff. Uh, and it's always between projects is where I feel like I can contribute to free software projects. Yeah. And maybe, maybe, maybe this time uh, in in the gap period, it's Inkscape that's going to get attention. Uh, maybe well, that, I don't know. <laughs> I, I would love that too. It's been on my to-do list for for so long. The the other one that that I find slightly irritates me is that uh, I used to be able to. I I don't know. Can is there a way to make docked dialogues not docked? Permanently yes. now. Okay. Yeah. So if I take that out of being docked, oh, I I can't do it anymore anyway. All right. Uh, I used to be able to press Shift Control E to bring up the export dialog, and then press Alt E to just do the export button. But that now brings up the edit menu because the dialog isn't modal anymore. I guess. Okay, so Shift Control E and it and it docks it, right? So it's a docked thing. Yeah. And then you do you what? You and press. I would press Alt E historically in in like zero four three. I would do Alt E to no. use the to activate the export button so that I could I think that button has a mnemonic because this is this it is used so... to yeah, yeah yeah it used to but I think it's been lost um, yeah people but like... even if it did uh, I think as a docked dialogue it's probably not gonna have the same thing so I don't think any buttons in the docked dialogues have activatable mnemonics that I can can see. Yeah, they should have focus, and then once once this once the widget, the parent widget has focus, then things like mnemonics should work, and they should over they should override the menu. Yeah, but I, I assume that I can probably in the keyboard binding stuff find somewhere that I can do the export thing directly without caring about the button. Maybe I'm not even export. Sure. Export area, export ID. Huh. Do export. There it is. Presumably is 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 going to do that. So that at least I can set a shortcut for, and then because yeah, I find if I'm making assets for games like you know, menu icons or whatever, then being able to Select the icon I want to export. And export it uh, in one one action is uh, it speeds things up when you've got a hundred to do, right? Okay, so I did that, and it said get file name out. Cannot determine input file file name from the file name extension. Because, you, you would have to. Yeah, yeah. It, it it wants to use this as the as the base. So oh, okay. Whatever yeah. whatever is in this box doesn't matter at all. Oh. Well, that's that's slightly less useful then. Yes. So you can set export file name is another shortcut. I don't quite understand that. I guess that applies that text field. Yeah, maybe. And this and this sounds so almost like an underexplored piece of fun functionality that that is begging for bug reports. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was one of those things where. Um, I could see that there was some UI work being done. And at the time that I spotted it, I was like, well, if this is still finding its feet and, and someone's in the middle of working on this, I don't necessarily want to um, get in the yeah. way of that. And then it's been, it's been years. And this, this export dialog makes me cry because in, in 1.2, which I think was when that this came in, um, it, it, was a lot of work for a Google summer summer of code, and it was incomplete. And yeah. so I had to basically drag it out of the bin and and hit it for a while until it it worked. And it's not there's a bunch of user experience decisions that I've slowly been trying to fix uh, over time. Right. Like for example, there's this one here where like you you can select which of these. Um, file types you want to save, you want to export to. And in, in previous versions, you would then press the export button and it would pop up a thing that's, that asked you what preferences you wanted. Whereas now, you, there's, you, it's a little pop-up. You can just press it. Yeah, OK. That, that's nice. Streamlines things a bit. Yeah. It's, it's super important for the batch exporter because you, you want to export like a bunch of stuff 
yeah, uh, yeah you're exporting like 30 things at once or something yeah exactly you want like two different dpis and then a different suffix and then what you don't want is these pop up, popping up halfway through the export with with batch export are you only able to select layers like i no. the other but oh no okay so if i have an object selected then it lets me do selection and if i have more layers i guess then i get or if i have i don't even know what pages are this pages is new to me <laughs> pages is a piece of fun functionality that i uh added uh because my patreons asked me to they were just like this is the most important thing yeah. for us so on the um it sounds right. cool like it, it moves more into a desktop publishing type space i guess a bit, yeah. So in 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 on the left hand side, you'll see that there's a pages tool. Yeah. And then, Can you scroll uh, that if uh, if the window is too small to show all the icons? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so I don't have a scroll wheel. I was going to say I don't have a scroll wheel. So if the scroll wheel does it, then I. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. The scroll wheel is the first thing to break on my um. On my mice all the time. Uh, we did do it so that you could both hide these and also like yeah pull this out. yeah pull it out yeah. So one thing so, that Blender does that I really enjoy is that middle click and drag um, is is allows you to pan any menu, any dialog, any anything like that, anything that can be scrolled. Uh, you can middle click and plan, pan, uh, middle click and drag to to move it around, which feels like. I don't know, for my repetitive strain injury is a lot nicer than flogging away at the uh, the scroll wheel itself. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the way the page, I'll just do a quick introduction to the page. Yeah, yeah, sorry. If you click, if it, you'll get a, a title bar, uh, sorry, a toolbar that you can see here. Uh, the first button creates a new page, so you can just literally just create a bunch of pages of the same size. Yeah. You can set the page size, uh, including clicking this button to do um, landscape or portrait. Uh, when when you click on the the drop down, you probably can't see the drop drop down. It looks really nice. You can select the page size, so like that's A five, mm -hmm. that's A two. So is that document wide or is that per page? That's per page. Yeah, right. Right, and so on the actual canvas, you, you can actually resize the, ca the particular page down to whatever size you want. You can type in whatever, and, and the thing is that this, this box, you, you could be like 45 pixels by 20 millimeters, because like, yeah. it just doesn't occur. It's very straightforward. Oh, that's a bug, that should have. That's not US letter, you're lying little toe rag. <laughs> no, I mean, no. <laughs> it's just folded up really small <laughs> okay i'm writing that down <laughs> uh, it's been useful <clears throat> today has been useful we found found a page bug and this is bug. cool i can see myself using this for more than just like actual page setting i could imagine using this for a bunch of different places where i would like to have multiple different contexts or things that I want to export separately and individually that I want to yes. not have overlapping within the document. That's, that's yeah. It's so, so, so the way to think about pages is people think of them as like collections of objects and it really isn't the way I designed this tool. It's, it's like uh, collections of canvases is what's going in my mind. It's a, it's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a rectangle. That's all it is. So if you create a, a, a rectangle, draw, draw one out, and then you move it over another one. Now I have two paid pages and I can draw an object and you can see it appears on both of them. Right. Right. So like those two pages don't have to be like in two different spaces. They can be overlapping if you want them to be. And these are, these are Inkscape specific elements, obviously they don't, they're not represented within the SVG spec. Exactly. Could you, could you yeah. map them to viewports? Um, I looked at a bunch of different ways of trying to do it, do it, and it, it causes lots of complexity. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, we've had, we've had about an hour. Yeah, uh, I hope I haven't gobbled up too much of your time. This has definitely been uh, exciting for me. There's a few bits and pieces that I've now become aware of that, uh, that I think will be able to aid my workflows a little bit. I did have some notes. Um, 
of things uh, from from poking around yesterday that I thought might be relevant, and I think we've covered most of them. I just want to have a quick squeeze back through. Um, I mentioned that I couldn't edit that uh, that placeholder text without having a text object to select first. Yeah. Um, and I also like there's no one thing that I and and I guess this comes back to what I was saying before about the way that screen real estate is ad allocated to fonts. Like it's and the collections thing kind of gets over this a little bit, but if at the moment, if I wanted to compare two fonts, um, I basically have to like put that in the document in order to be able to see them next to each other or, or really get a feel for what's going on. Cause the tiny, tiny font preview next to the font name is often not enough to really get a feel for, for what's going on there. Yeah. What would you do? Um, would, you, would, you have, would you have it here at the bottom? I don't, I, I, don't, I kind of like the idea of like if you selected multiple items in this list, although maybe that doesn't make sense because like you can't apply multiple fonts to one object and that creates a, a weird ex user expectation. But it would be kind of cool if you could select multiples and just have the text shown in a couple of different fonts. You kind of can because if you think about how it works in CSS. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like the order of prioritization. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's interesting. That is an interesting thing to be able to define fallbacks using the. the the font editor like that. That is a that's yeah. a really cool point. That's not a bug, but it is an interesting future feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say that's not something that Inkscape has any concept of. Yeah. That I that I'm aware of, yeah. Um but yeah the idea of being able to select multiple items in the list and being able to see the the sample text uh in each font would be kind of fun. Yeah, I like that. Um, in, in addition to some of the things that have like that, the font collections thing is really cool, but I wonder whether it would be nice to just have the ability to, um, mark a font as used, even if it's not used so that it pops up to the top on its own. I see. Like it's just used, but not used. Yeah, yeah. So you you're effectively pinning it in the list if that if that made sense. Yeah. Um as as like a a quick way of of doing some of those you know that kind of prioritization without having to engage with the more complex longer longer view oriented uh collection stuff because if you're like trying to pick between say seven fonts that are spread throughout your list and you want to be able to flip back and forth between them like being able to just get those to the top of the list without having to create a, a new collection for them before you've decided what you wanted. Uh, feels like it could be, could be nice from a workflow perspective. Um, and, and another thing that I was thinking last night, and obviously it's not, doesn't expose a lot of useful things, but uh, most font formats have a description field and all font formats, I think have like an author field and stuff. It would be nice to be able to see some of that metadata for the, the currently selected font. Yeah, it's not it's not in here, right? I don't think it's listed there. That I I didn't see it when I was looking last night. No, these are all just settings. Yeah, and like that's that's like glyph metadata and other like internal data yeah. for how the font should be rendered, and that stuff's important for sure. Um, I mean, par partially this is this is important for licensing. Like, yeah, yeah, the, we should have that as a primary piece of information about which of these fonts are open and which of them are per for personal use, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think like anything that encourages people to be aware of and mindful of licenses feels really important um, yeah. as, as part of like a participant in the free software ecosystem or open culture ecosystem, or however you want to view it, like, um, promoting those ideals and also exposing, like putting that information, keeping it on hand for users who, who are going to respect and care about it. Uh, both, both feel like worthwhile initiatives. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree. Uh, licensing for me is, you know, it's an education. So it's the thing I, I, I say to people who come to the Inkscape project and they say, um, oh, why would you bother telling anybody that it's free software, it's open source? I'm like, nobody cares. They just want a tool that they can use to do, they have a practical problem. And I'm like, yeah, that's absolutely true. We should respect the fact that they've come to solve a particular problem. But yeah. 
we always have to be mindful of the fact that we have a responsibility to educate people about free software. It's yeah. a part yeah. of the mission. My because own person into um, you know the, the free software community and, and discovering all of this stuff was that I, I kind of got to a point where I was like, you know, if, if a piece of software isn't worth paying for, it probably isn't worth pirating. And I don't think Photoshop's worth paying for, so I'm going to see what else is out there. And coming across GIMP, which has been a solid workhorse for me for a long, long I'm, I'm in the process of moving to Credo because I think Credo aligns more with what I actually do. Um, but GIMP has been a very usable tool for me for a very long time. Um, and and I, I started using Inkscape as well. Uh, and and yeah, that, that kind of transition eventually led me to understand and, and become exposed to some of these free software ideals. And that in turn led me to start using Linux as a desktop operating system and le led me to contribute upstream to a couple of projects. And yeah, like that as a gateway alone is justification for, for exposing that stuff, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because we're, we're if you don't, no one knows me, you know. Sorry. If you don't, then no one like if you don't make it discoverable, then no one knows about it, and nobody ends up participating. Right? If not us, then yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, if it, it's it's um, it, free songs and software from my perspective is in, is in, is in its very very early days right now, right? There'll come a time in the future when it's just a critical part of how the world works in such a way that it's not just hidden, and makes things go in the background, but it is a fundamental right that everybody just expects. They're just like, yeah. why, why would you have, like, not have ownership over your software? That doesn't make any sense. And unfortunately, right. I think we'll get there without some crisis because human society <laughs> is very reluctant to recognize yes. and respect solutions to problems, <laughs> even when there's a community fighting for the, for, for ju justice in that particular I, corner. I think the past several years has said very loudly what kind of priorities humanity at large has oh. and how resistant they are to change in general when there is clear and, and obvious benefits. Let me, let me just say um, thank you for join, joining me in case I overuse this video. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then... Um, we can pause the it's recording. Been, it's been great. Like I said, it's been uh, been great. I'm very excited to to go and and play around with some of these these things that we've discussed.